Well, we want to learn more about Miss Virginia here, and we were told you were the guy to ask. Tell us what it took to get this airplane here today. Well, the first thing I have to say that it took was a lot of effort. Uh, we decided during the middle of the winter when we realized that they were going to do this effort that uh, we made the decision to go ahead and pull the airplane out of storage, in which it had been for 10 years, and uh, go ahead and refurbish it and get it ready for this event because it's such a monumental event. And we've been operating DC-3s since 1965 and owning and operating DC-3s, so we just thought uh, we had to do it, get the airplane here for a lot of folks. What can you tell me about the history of this particular aircraft? Yeah, this particular airplane was built as a C-47A. It was, it was built in Long Beach in April of 1943. To be absolutely accurate, it was never an Air Force airplane. The Army actually kept the airplane, uh, of course, right post-World War II. Uh, it went from Army Air Force, a lot of airplanes went from Army Air Force to U.S. Air Force. This airplane actually did not go to U.S. Air Force. It stayed as an Army airplane uh, throughout its career. Uh, what kind of paint it would have had on in the 40s, that I don't have clarity to. It, I have a picture of the airplane uh, at the airplane in 1974, which was a very unique Army paint job, one of which you probably wouldn't want to replicate. It's certainly shiny now. Uh, we heard you put a quite a number of hours into this aircraft getting it ready to come here for this event. What, what all was, was involved? What did it mean? Yeah, well, first of all, it was a very good airplane. I, I would give you a little history about what it had done in the meantime uh, since 75. But in 1999 was the last time that we operated it. We stored it and we ran the engines up uh, every several years and, and uh, generally kept after the airplane. Uh, some, but uh, having sat for 10 years, even though it was a very, very good airframe to start with, uh, it just needed a lot of work. We had some rust here and we some hardware and so forth, but it just needed a general refurbishing. And when we pulled it out, we checked the engines out, the engines looked very good. We did some new upholstery, we, we changed the paint scheme some, although the bottom of the airplane is still the silver that it was and the top is still the white. We did change it some and then uh, a uh, tremendous amount of polishing. Uh, our company hires about 30 students during the summer interns. We had about six, seven, eight interns uh, throughout the summer uh, polishing on it and getting it up to where it is now. And then uh, I, I really liked the mid 50s, mid 60s Air Force um, uh, paint scheme. And uh, I like the white, it's very practical because the top, the white uh, takes off the heat. Freedom through performance. At Cirrus, performance is not simply the measurement of a single design parameter. Rather, it's a total package. It's optimum balance of speed, efficiency, comfort, safety, ease of flight, and quality. We call it Cirrus Flying 2.0. Aren't you ready to feel the freedom? Miss Virginia because it's from Virginia, but there's a little story behind it. My hobby is reading history. And uh, so anyway, I, as, as you do today, you went and Googled, and I wanted to put some nose art on it. But I had to be nose art that had some degree of reality here for, the, for today's properness, so to speak. And uh, I couldn't find anything, but I, I, I went and Googled Miss Virginia. The font that is on that Miss Virginia was the exact font that was on a P-38 flown by Rex Barber, Lieutenant Rex Barber, who uh, was credited with shooting down uh, Admiral Yamamoto on Borgainsville Island, I believe April of 1943. So we, we uh, got a, a, a picture of the nose art off of his P-38 and the font that you'll see, of course it's not a font as in an official font, mm -hmm. but the, uh, the script Right. It's exactly, it's, it's, it's as perfect to Rex Barber's uh, P-38 nose art as we could make. So oh. it, it does have a tie-in with, with World War II. We completely upgraded the avionics, and we have a Garmin 530, and a Garmin 430, and a Garmin 330, and a gyrus and compass in it. So as far as an, as an IFR platform, it's a genuine, solid, current avionics. Now, we didn't... Uh, it still has instruments that you would have expected, mostly uh, back in that day, uh, but it's a very, very solid uh, IFR platform. What do the purists say when they look in your, in your cockpit? Well, there's a number of things that aren't quite perfect about it. And, you know, at the end of the day, to be practical, if you're going to go somewhere, you're going to have modern radios. A, a lot of airplanes 
sort of had 60s to 70s avionics, which aren't purest either. Right. So uh, our notion was to put a set of avionics in it that everybody used, is used to. We got next next rad uh, downlink uh, weather in it. So you know you come up here and the weather's bad and you poke through it and go. So it gives you everything that you'd have in a modern airplane. From a, are we going to get there? Are we going to get there safely? The beauty of the Release 9 system architecture is that you have two fully redundant integrated flight displays. Each has access to all the systems and data. Providing full redundancy and eliminating traditional reversionary modes, Release 9 allows either display to be configured as the PFD. Now your failure modes are much more manageable because you can continue to fly with the same familiar display symbology without the need to relearn composite modes you don't typically fly with. Avidyne's Integra Release 9 is truly the next generation in fully integrated flight deck technology. First takeoff was nine days ago. We blew the engine right shortly after takeoff and had to come back in, made a single engine landing, and changed the engine. And then uh, we're working on the other engine, found a cracked cylinder on that engine, so we changed that. So at the end of the day, uh, we feel like we got a real good airframe with real good engines, with a zero time engine, and the other engine has about 300 hours. So we're, we're kind of set in place to go for a while, we think. The airplane was, uh, when it was surplus from the United States government, it was surplus and given to an organization called JARS, Jungle Aviation Radio Service in Waxhaw, North Carolina. And they spent about four years uh, completely refurbishing the airplane, bringing a lot of the systems up to date. They, they did a lot of, of mod modification to the airplane. They operated in Columbia for Wycliffe Bible Translators um, from 1980 to 1990. It was, and it has some nose art up in the front of the, the front bulkhead, which is beautiful. It's uh, about Colombia, South South America, but they were they were supporting the natives there and, and uh, doing Bible translation. So it became surplus to their needs in 1990, and Dynamic Aviation bought it. We were K and K aircraft at that point in time, but it's Dynamic Aviation now. And from 1990 to 1999, we did several things with it. We we actually had five of them that we were, or four of them at that point in time that we were doing spring with the area of spring. And we did um, spring for gypsy moth and spring for large area uh, mosquito uh, issues like we sprayed all over the United States with uh, for, for those kind of issues. And then we would uh, go to Oshkosh uh, most years and for during that period of time in the 90s, we flew the Liberty parachute team uh, most of the time for the Oshkosh Air Show, so we got to, got to do that for quite a while. It was a lot of fun. And we also would take uh, some representatives from the state of Virginia up to Oshkosh to have them as part of that. So by the fall of 1999, we had moved to a completely turbine fleet of aircraft, turboprop fleet of aircraft, and no longer uh, operated piston airplanes. So.